All right, I think we should begin. Hi everybody, my name is Samantha Loy and welcome to our webinar today from the Young Onset Dementia Special Interest Group. I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather here today. And for me, that's the Wurundjeri people, the Kula Nation. I'd like to extend my welcome to the elders past, present and emerging, and also extend that welcome to anyone who is Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders who are here today. So welcome to our webinar. And the topic today is on the three Ds of young onset dementia. And the key question of the topic of inquiry and conversation we are about to engage in is how can we assure that the best death possible for the person with young onset dementia? And this webinar has been mostly organised by Vicky Barry and Jade Cartwright. So I thank you for that. And also Monica Cations has been helping with the webinar too. So we will focus on the advanced and terminal stages of dementia where death is likely to occur within the last 12 months of life. And I'm going to hand over shortly to Vicky Barry, who will facilitate and direct the conversation to ensure we optimise the time available. At the same time, it's supposed to be generative. So for those who are watching, please use the Q&A function to make comments, and we will monitor, monitor this and come to the questions at the end of the webinar. I'll be 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. I would like to now introduce Vicky Barry, who is a care partner who has been supporting her husband living with young onset dementia for the past 12 years. She's an accomplished professional with a background in health, management and social services, and she's now in early retirement balancing the caring role with project of interest, community education advocacy. She's been hosting conversations and special events on death and dying since establishing the Perth Death Cafe in 2014. In 2020, Vicky was awarded an AMP Tomorrow Maker Grant to fund the development of a social impact model for end-of-life care planning in the community. Vicky has established a Young Onset Dementia Network in WA in 2017 in response to the rollout of the NDIS, which was a time of great uncertainty as funding and service provision was being reviewed and redirected. This network provides peer support for people living with young onset dementia their care partners and families, and currently has over 100 members. So thank you, Vicky. I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Sam. So Kaya and greetings, everyone. Um, just while the conversation um, takes place, if you hear the acronym YOD, it stands for Young Onset Dementia, probably be using that a lot in conversation, I will be. And when I'm referring to a care partner, I mean someone's spouse, um, de facto mother, father, it could be a sibling or a close friend. So I'm really looking at the primary caregiver, whoever that might be. So I'm going to jump straight in because time is going to be of the essence and I'll be pretty much directing the conversation, uh, bearing in mind the time constraint that we have and the content that we're going to be covering. So Wendy, um, you enjoyed a long and successful career as a registered nurse before early retirement yourself to care for your partner, Keith. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2011 at the age of 52 and died seven years later in 2018, age 59, which coincidentally fits very neatly with the life expectancy for most people mm -hmm. living with you, yeah. which is between seven and 10 years. So, um, what did the last 12 months of his life look like and what was your experience of the end of life care? Thank you, Vicky. Um, I um, managed quite well at home up until the last 12 months. Um, and at that point, I realised that I was no longer the best person to be looking after my husband. Um, I was worn out and he needed um, around-the-clock care. Um, so I put him into a, a care facility um, and he was uh, not very happy about that, um, but he stayed there and, and about nine months into that, no, sorry, about six months into that uh, journey, he started developing um, a delirium. And typically, as most people would know, a delirium is in response to an infection or pain or some sort of um, uh, situation that the um, person living with dementia has. So they did all the tests and couldn't find anything, um, no infections, no pain, 
it progressed and then he became quite um, aggressive to the point where the nursing home could no longer um, have him because he was um, he became a risk to other patients and to himself. So um, at about the eight month mark, he was sent to a an older person's mental health facility, and he was commenced on some um, antipsychotic medication. And it was just a slippery slope from there. He, they tried many different medications. They um, uh, he was there for four months, and he was progressively getting worse and worse to the point where, as a registered nurse, I knew that we had reached the point of no return. They had tried so much. Um, he was deteriorating in front of my eyes. It was dreadful. Uh, so I requested they got the Metropolitan Palliative Care team to come and do an assessment on him. And that's what happened. And a lovely um, palliative care doctor came out and sat me down, explained the whole process. And there was a fairly strict criteria, which I was pleased to hear about. Um, so he he came and he did a series of little tests and said, look, he's still uh, not what we call ready for end of life, but I'll come back in a fortnight. And so that happened four times. On the fourth time, he came back and he said, he's ready for end of life care. So we transferred him to a palliative care hospital in Perth and he had explained everything to me. Um, from the time he reached the palliative care hospital, he was given nothing to eat or drink. He was kept sedated. He had no pain. He was just sleeping. I was there beside him. I had a little bed beside him. We were living in this little room together. I was told it would take 7 to 14 days. It took up heaven and it was so peaceful and it was so lovely to see him so relaxed and so comfortable after those five, four or five months of struggling with the delirium and the anger and the um, uh, sort of abuse, uh, the, yeah, all of that. So that was my experience. Um, and as, um, as an advocate, I have been quite open about talking about that. There was nothing that we did that we shouldn't have done. All the checks and balances were in place. Uh, he he was um, insentient. He had no reflexes when at the time that we transferred him over to the palliative care hospital. So I have never, ever felt that I did the wrong thing. I felt very proud that I was strong enough to do that. That's great. Thanks, Wendy. Um, I did have some other, but I think you've answered that really well and I think given us a very well-rounded picture of what it, you know, a real-life experience looks like. So um, you mentioned, you know, the whole issue of delirium and, of course, we know there's distress as well and that's frequent throughout the last year or so of life for people with dementia and particularly when they're presenting with challenging behaviours. So... And the other thing, unlike an older person with dementia, oftentimes a person with YOD doesn't have other comorbidities. So we just purely focused on managing the dementia. So it can make it difficult for health uh, professionals to manage and recognise when people with dementia are approaching the end of life. And you actually did say, Wendy, that you had you know, the specialist four times come and attend yeah. Keith before that determination was made. So Alyssa, as a um, geriatrician and palliative care physician in, a, in an acute hospital setting, how do you assess when a person with YOD is in the terminal phase of life and that death is imminent? What do you, what do you have, what tools, what are you looking for? You know, what history? Yeah, thanks Vicky. I think we need to look at um, a person's sort of trajectory in the months and years leading up to um, the current presentation. I think um, Wendy spoke about delirium and it is quite common for people with dementia to have delirium. It can be from a minimal trigger like constipation um, or change of environment, uh, or it can be something more dramatic like a severe infection. Um, and usually it's a combination of things. And I think that it's important that we 
know what delirium is reversible or partially reversible and what might be um, potentially uh, the end of life. Um, so if someone's been managing quite well at home, still fairly robust and, and independent or even in a an, um, residential setting and they become delirious, then we need to think that's possibly not the end of life and there's something reversible there. Whereas if it's following a, a gradual downhill trajectory, then we're more likely to think that it could indicate end of life. Um, and we look at other things like potentially blood tests, um, examination findings, looking at their vital signs and things like that to help help us tell. Um, and really it's the, the caregiver um, who knows that person best that we also turn to. Um, okay, so in the general population in Australia, um, the death rates are the highest at the moment for dementia, followed by heart disease, stroke, and then lung cancer. And yet compared to patients with cancer, the proportion of people with a diagnosis of dementia using specialist palliative care services is low. It's actually 2.4% compared to 74.5% of those with a malignancy. So whilst there's no shortage of palliative care service, there does seem to be a lack of referral for people with dementia to access those services. So Alyssa, can you, um, you know, what are your thoughts and why do you think this is so? There's many reasons for this. One is that people don't realise that dementia is a terminal illness. Um, both in the broader community, but also amongst health professionals. Um, it's also that palliative care services traditionally were set up to manage people with um, cancer who had traditionally have a very different um, disease trajectory to people with dementia. As you mentioned with YOD, the life expectancy is seven to 10 years. Um, and our models of care just aren't set up to provide um, care over that prolonged period. Um, there's also some attitudes in some specialist palliative care services that um, dementia is not a disease that they look after um, or potentially a lack of skills as well in caring for people with dementia. Um, and obviously resourcing is, a, is an issue as well. Um, so there are many reasons, um, but I think we need different models of care uh, to provide better palliative care for people with dementia and particularly younger onset dementia. Fabulous. So does anyone else want to comment on that in the panel? Oh, I was just going to comment um, on how I felt very lucky that I sort of had um, a bit of knowledge about palliative care and the way the system worked as a nurse. And I felt that if I hadn't known that, it, that it would have been so different. Mm. I concur with that, Wendy, absolutely. And what I know coming out of the network, I mean, we've had in the last two years, I think close to 20 of our members have died. There's only three of us out of the original group that still have our loved ones at home, the rest are in care. So um, I think that sort of says a lot. Mm. But anyway, if, and that's actually a good segue because if we consider the demands of caring and the diversity of family structures, it's not surprising that about 80% of people living with Yod will die in a residential care facility. It just gets too hard, as Wendy described. And, you know, if you look at the family structures, and I'll just give you a quick overview. We've got a 38-year-old with a two-year-old, you know, married with a two-year-old child. We've got uh, another family where there are three dependents of, um, and, you know, She's a, a nurse during the day, so to keep her registration current, she has to work. Um, and uh, she's also caring for two sets of ageing parents. And <laughs> I don't know, that caring would get much more difficult than that. So that sort of just gives you some idea. And then we've got people living singly and independent, and the mother or the parent is having, or family are having to step in and actually provide that support and care. We've had others where the um, partner has actually decided to leave the marriage because it's just too hard and they, you know, don't, you just can't do it. So just gives you a picture. Most of us struggle to keep up with work and end up reducing hours or giving up altogether. So you can imagine the impacts for a family is huge when you're living with young onset dementia and vicariously as a care partner, your life, you know, 
forget having a social life. Um, it's just, yeah, the demands of caring are just so great. Anyway, um, so the decision, though, I think what I'd like to um, look at is you know, and I'm going to move to you, Ray, because that's your area of specialty. But, you know, the, the question and the decision to um, transition a loved one to um, residential care is a big one, as Wendy described, and, you know, really kind of the last resort. Although oftentimes with Yod, it's probably a lot earlier than we would like because we just can't cope. So... Um, Ray, you're a nurse practitioner and a clinical consultant. You're currently providing residential outreach support and advice. But when we first met, you were the clinical and operations manager at an aged care facility that supported residents who were of Croatian, Italian sort of background. Um, and it was really interesting. From the moment I entered that facility, I hadn't met you at all. But it was lively and it was just full of energy. And I thought, oh my God, they're doing something here that no one else is doing because it wasn't the usual sort of experience and what I feel when I go into care facilities. So I was very curious when I met you and it wasn't long before your passion and your dedication and the work that you do was very eminent, um, very obvious. So, you know, I consider you one of those exemplars in that space. So would you please share your insights into the kind of policies and practices that you set up and developed while you were there? Thanks, Vicky. Yeah, thank you for the kind words. Um, good morning, everyone. So uh, this was my previous um, employment lifetime. So with, with working as a clinical operations manager and particularly being working in aged care facilities, there's a lot of struggles in terms of clinical practice, person-centered care, a lot of specialist involvement um, in terms of delivering care. So what I have done at the facility really is to um, collaborate with the families from day one. Um, so on admission, it's really around having a discussion about um, the diagnosis, for example, with dementia being life limiting and really having a discussion on what to do should things happen. Um, it's the ongoing partnership with the family members in really providing that holistic care because at times what's written in textbooks may not be really what's appropriate when it comes to the delivery of care because of other things, particularly culture, um, being a culturally and linguistically diverse facility. So with that, it's really developing a care plan that is so person-centered that if a resident wants to eat whatever they wanted to eat, as long as it is in moderation, then it's really supporting that. It's having a discussion around risks um, and it's being, it is okay to take risks as well. Um, and if things do deteriorate, um, particularly with someone with your, um, with um, say their overall health is deteriorating, then it's having a discussion again with the family, with the GP, with the geatrician in terms of what is reversible, what is not reversible, what can we do to treat, um, and then looking at the trajectory of the patient within the last three to six months. Um, and if it's quite obvious that the patient really is deteriorating um, and you know, we're looking at a trajectory of three to six months, then making the last three to six months really worth it. Um, enjoying the last few days of their life, the few weeks of their life really, you know, they may have some swallowing issues, but for them, if eating fish and chips is really important, then allow them to have fish and chips because it's really around making sure that you know, the, the last few days, the last few weeks of their life is really worth living and it's meaningful rather than giving them something that they don't like because we're so strict of making sure that they don't aspirate, they don't choke. It's literally around supporting really the choices and having the family members at the bedside as well, answering their questions um, and being supportive really that it's okay to take those risks. Actually, that narrating the bedside, it's interesting. I'm a great fan of Catherine Mannix, and she talks a lot about that. And I think it is so important, as you describe, Ray, that, you know, as clinicians, physicians, we're actually that communication and keeping the family abreast of what's going on and, you know, and absolutely including them and engaging with them as, you know, we get closer and to the end of life. Um, does anyone else want to say anything around um, that? Any, okay, let's move on. So one of the really interesting things that came out of the preparation that I was doing for this webinar was the whole 
you know, the introduction of the National Disability Insurance Scheme in 2016 actually changed a lot of things, particularly for YOD. And it's actually added another layer of complexity because not only are we navigating the health system but we're also, and the My Age Care system, we're now navigating NDIS. And one of the things that I discovered in the, you know, the government now is mandating that we don't, uh, you know, uh, people, young people are not to enter residential aged care unless it'll be an exception, you know, under, only under exceptional circumstances. So the preference is obviously to get them into supported disability accommodation or independent living. So then I thought, well, what does end of life care look like for those people? And we've got a few in our network that are just venturing on that track, um, but we haven't actually had any deaths while they've been in a disability care facility. So then I rang a couple of um, well-known service providers and asked their senior, like the directors and so forth. And actually they said, there is really little evidence base. It's not discreetly, uh, palliative care is not discreetly funded under NDIS. And the only um, example I could find of anyone who had died was a woman who actually had another comorbidity and was actually transferred to hospital for acute care for that and was subsequently treated and died in hospital. So this begs the question, what does end of life look like for those living in disability residential care and, um, and whose responsibility is it? So Ray, I'm going to ask you to kickstart this because you're on the care line where you're a consultant. Are you getting any calls from people um, who are, you know, trying to support a young person at end of life? Um. Yes and no, Vicky. Um, for us, there is a set clinical criteria and normally people living with dementia um, normally gets referred to us because of behavioral challenges um, and that could be because of an infection. Um, so what we do is we then go out and review those patients um, and from, from that visit, we do a comprehensive assessment. Um, and if and when there is a need to have a discussion around end of life or palliative care or even looking at a more conservative approach that's when we then have to discuss it with the JP um, GP being holding the, the, the medical governance of our um, our involvement and then having to have a discussion around which um, other specialist um, services may be able to join and be part of a team um, so the metropolitan palliative um, care team specialists I mean um, they could be the one involved um, we could look at geotrician depending Depending on which age is based, then we could have a chat with them, um, particularly for the ones that are quite complicated. Um, as what you've said, navigating the services that are available out there really needs a lot of people involved just to make sure that we are not really missing anything, we're not missing any gap. Um, so that's what we do. So we bring, we bring everyone at the facility, um, have a discussion on how to manage um, and that may include um, other private um, services really that may be what which may form part. Um, and that also includes some of the hospice um, services that are in hospital, um, if and when that is that is the, the, the management plan. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna have to move on because I'm just looking at the time and still got a fair bit to cover. So now let's consider the option to continue to care in the family home until the end. Um, and we know in the general population, most people would prefer to die in the familiarity and comfort of home, though um, when faced with the end of life, it's often not practicable and certainly not in the case of dementia. So um, we only have one carer couple that I know of that um, where death is probably likely to occur at home and that person is now bedfast, non-verbal and needing 24 hour two person assist to manage their care needs. So it's pretty heavy going. Um, and it's interestingly, when the NDIS funding was reviewed um, in recent times, it was decided to slash their funding because it was determined they didn't need the same level of care given she was no longer mobile and, you know, da, da, da. So you can imagine, <laughs> what that felt like for the, uh, for the family. Anyway, an appeal was set in motion 
and um, the care partner presented to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. And yes, the decision was reversed and actually the funding was increased commensurate with the goals of care. And I'm hoping that this will be a landmark case for um, to follow because as I say, we're entering new ground here and really there's not a lot of evidence base. So Andrew, um, um, we have the highest death rate at home in WA, um, largely attributed to the quality of the community specialist palliative care service operated by Silver Chain. And that's evolved quite significantly over the last 40 years since it was established. In your position as Director of Clinical Operations overseeing the service, have you experienced any demand from the odd cohort? And I'm particularly curious to know about the advanced um, dementia specialist service that was trialled a couple of years ago. What did the delivery of that service look like? And what were the findings and the outcomes? Thanks, Vicky. Can I just check that you can hear me okay? Great. Um, the service has always supported people um, living with dementia, but I guess I'd like to come back to the points that Alyssa made because they're actually all key points um, at the present time. And that's the often, I guess, reduced ability of services um, to meet um, the needs of people living with dementia, particularly people with younger onset dementia, um, because of those issues around um, how palliative care services were established in the first place, um, so that it's taken them quite some time to recognise um, that dementia is a terminal illness, it's a life-limited condition of its own, and that they're a very legitimate cohort um, for palliative care. What often used to happen was that people would be supported um, and they would um, be supported with dementia, but there was often another um, condition, underlying condition, perhaps a cancer, that was often the primary reason for them having contact with the, the palliative care service. So for people with younger onset dementia, they pose a particular um, challenge, I think, to um, palliative care services. And that's something that we've been trying to um, address. And certainly we piloted um, an advanced dementia um, service and we used um, nurse practitioners to do that. But what we found was that in fact, the, the outcomes of the pilot, while it was very, while we learned a lot, um, we felt that we actually needed to bring um, the, 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 the pilot back into the mainstream service. Because what it had done was to, in some ways, communicate to people within the service that they could refer out as opposed to addressing the needs of that particular cohort within the main community specialist palliative care service, which is what we were trying to achieve in the first place. So we wanted to bring it back in because we consider that they are very much a part of the specialist palliative care services cohort. But I think another point which Elisa also alluded to was the whole issue around um, early referral to palliative care. Now, clearly, we go on a lot about the benefits of early referral to palliative care. The international literature demonstrates the positive outcomes. But often with many services, and it's um, in part related to resourcing, as Alyssa also identified, we often can become more of an end of life service rather than a community specialist palliative care service. And that's something we've been trying to address over the last few years so that it should be possible for people to be referred early for the level of involvement of a specialist palliative care services to be much more nuanced and targeted so that if we get involved early, we do some really important work initially and then we pull, pull out or pull back um, and then get re-engaged a bit later on, all of those options should be available. What tends to happen, and again, it's historical because of how um, palliative care has been set up and how um, the, the, the larger number of people within the cohort were people with cancers, um, we would often provide the full interdisciplinary team bells and whistles approach to everyone that came into um, the service. Now, I think another point that's also been identified is the length um, of deterioration for somebody with younger onset dementia. 
Because what's really interesting, it's not that specialist palliative care services don't have experience working with people um, with significant um, cognitive deterioration and issues related to that, because we support many younger people with a variety of brain cancers. And they're very complex and they have some of this, uh, some similar issues. But often, I think part of the issue is the length of time that we're often talking about. And it's about our services being able to be a lot more responsive um, as we progress. Um, the other one I think that's so important is that we need to be working much more in partnership um, with other specialist services, um, particularly with geriatricians, psychogeriatricians, because what our palliative care doctors would say is that particularly for early access by younger people, um, we don't necessarily have the expertise around um, issues related to medication, prescription, those sorts of things. Um, and we really need to draw on the expertise from our colleagues in those other disciplines. And, to, and we're really at the very early stages of developing those partnerships. Okay, that's great. That's fantastic. Thanks, Andrew. So um, I'm going to move on to the next talking point, which is around advanced care planning. So it's clear, it's obviously um, at some point, we need to talk about what's important to the person with dementia, what they want to happen and where they want to be cared for as the disease progresses. So for many of us, these are not conversations we're comfortable with and um, they can be unwelcome and anxiety provoking. So advanced care planning is a process of planning for future healthcare and medical treatments, which comes into effect when the person is no longer able to make their own healthcare decisions. In the case of a person living with young onset dementia, clearly the sooner this is done, the better whilst they are competent and able to make informed decisions. However, this is also likely to be the time when they are going to be in denial of having dementia. Um, and it's really tricky trying to initiate these conversations earlier. So, um, and then of course that old problem, the um, chestnut of the issue of decision-making capacity and more often than not, it's assumed that people with dementia lack decision-making capacity. It's important to note that the law presumes an adult has decision-making capacity unless there is evidence to the contrary. So having capacity when making a decision means that a person can understand the facts and the choices involved, weigh up the consequences and communicate the decision. I'm a big fan of supported decision making that recognises the right of a person with a disability to be engaged, uh, to be enabled to make or communicate decisions with regard to personal or legal matters, which is different from the role of a substitute decision um, maker. Craig, this is your area of specialty as a researcher who has spent many years undertaking applied research in the areas of advanced care planning decision-making capacity and supported decision-making, particularly in the context of cognitive impairment and dementia. To provide some clarity for us, please describe what support for decision-making um, looks like in terms of understanding a person's wishes to inform advanced care planning and treatment-related decision-making, and how can we best engage a person with YOD in advanced care planning to assure the best outcomes that reflect their wishes and um, their values and preferences at end of life? Big question. Pull it apart. <laughs> Thanks, Vicky, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I, I guess in starting to answer your question, Vicky, I, I think it is a, a big and a broad reaching um, topic and, and some uh, questions within that. But um, I guess to start, the first and, and most helpful thing we could do really talks back to, to what a no, number of the other panellists have already raised, which is about having ongoing conversations from the first time, for example, that a service comes into contact with a person or and, and or with their family. Um, and, and even in advance of um, a diagnosis like YOD, which is you know very confronting and, and really changes the environment, not only for the person, but the family and and friends around that person to be normalizing these sort of conversations in in everyday life so that as as adults and as citizens we are starting to have 
these conversations um, and and that through that, you know, we may be a little bit more familiar with some of the topics and, and familiar with that feeling of being confronted with our own mortality if if there was the situation that, that a diagnosis like this um, did happen for a person. Of course, when somebody is actually diagnosed with a condition like dementia, which is known to have impacts on cognition, so, so how we think and organise information, as well as communication and even emotion regulation and, and how we interact with each other socially, there is a need to think about how that changes life now and also what might be coming ahead. And and dementia, not only younger onset dementia, but but all dementias have an inherent uncertainty in that there's not a clear, definite prognosis around exactly what's going to happen right at the end of life. And, and as you said before, Vicky, the life expectancy, you know, can extend and 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 people are showing that that with changes to lifestyle, you know, that um, cognitive decline can be slowed. So we don't know exactly how um, the end of life may turn out for every person. But what we can say is that there's a framework in which these um, discussions can happen. And there's a lot of resources out there that are available to help people. There's a set of legal frameworks that that enable people to specify things that are really important to them, either by doing that on an advanced care directive, which which then becomes legally binding when they're no longer able to make their own decisions, or by nominating a trusted person or or multiple people to to be that that person who would really understand what the person wants and and to try to put that into effect. Um, and coming to the final part of your question, I guess, which was how how do we understand the role of support for decision making in this whole situation? Um, I have referred a few times to this idea of, you know, when a person can make decisions or when they can't make decisions. And as as I'm sure others on the, the call would understand from their experience, um, actually working closely with people over time, that doesn't happen at a, at a particular moment in time. It does, you don't just move from being able to make your own decisions to not being able to make those decisions. It's impacted by daily events. It's impacted by people's you know, pre-existing education and socioeconomic factors and the family support they have. Um, so, so what we see really is is a fluctuation of decision making abilities, um, which can be actually for a meaningful amount of time. They can be assisted, you know, to 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 have a more positive um, environment in which to make decisions and therefore um, to have to be supported in their decision making. And this, I guess, would start with very simple things like if if you're somebody who's trying to provide support, knowing that person really well is a great place to start because you know the sort of things that that help them feel comfortable and relaxed and um, and on the other hand, the things that might trigger them or 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 get them feeling anxious and and not focused on the decision at hand. We can also do things to try to um, present options in simple and and clear ways for example by um uh, clarifying and reducing the number of options that we present to people which start with understanding what are the things that a person is is valuing most in their life and what are the relevant options for them and then focusing on those rather than for example thinking about everything that might be available in in the ndis um services that are that that, that are on offer um, so, so I guess starting with, as I said, knowing the person well, knowing what they value and thinking about what's been important to them across their life is a great place to start, I guess, in making that decision making a bit more manageable for people. Um, so I might stop there because I've yeah, talked for yeah. a while, but yeah. That's great. No, that's good. I think that whole, like you say, it's that variability and fluctuation and yeah, and I know for Mike, you know, that on any given day, there are moments where I can have, you wouldn't even know he had dementia, and then there are other times you just can't even find the toilet or go to the toilet. So it's just, you know, it's amazing what how a day looks like. There is no regular day. Um, can, I, can I just ask, Vicky, sorry, one question. Yeah. With an advanced care directive, if that's being made when they have capacity, is that able to be used 
down the track because I was under the impression they actually had to at the time also again um, state what they wanted. Da, 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 da. Do you know? Craig, do you like to respond to that? So we're talking yeah. advanced health directive, yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, if we're thinking within the, for example, the West Australian context, yeah. that that legally binding document is called an advanced health directive. Yeah. And it's owned by other names in other states. If that document refers to medical treatments yeah. that are relevant to the decision at hand and um, and it's not foreseeable that the person would have changed their mind, for example, there's not suddenly a miraculous cure that's been discovered in the time since the person made the directive, yeah. then, yes, that that is legally binding. Okay. That's interesting because that was something that we looked into, but mm. we were told not to bother because when my husband lost capacity it wouldn't stand yeah <laughs> so well that, just it but that was that was five years ago yeah. so things have I, th I think um wendy that that also reflects what what we know from this field of advanced care planning that there is confusion okay. not only in the yeah. among the public but among health professionals yeah, as well sure. as to the legal standing and okay. and for example in new south wales um these documents are not that there's no statutory legislation right. supporting them but they are still binding under common law. Yeah. I think the the other common situation that is confusing is that we confuse um, the broader process of advanced care planning and the range of other written documents that might be called advanced care plans yeah. with yeah. the formal legally binding advanced well, care directives. Okay. Uh, but the uh, main uh, thing, the main thing that that discriminates them, I guess, is that the person wrote it themselves and and was able to at least or direct someone to write it while they had capacity. Yeah. Whereas an advanced care plan, we don't know for sure actually how that document yeah. was formulated. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. The other thing, yeah. I mean, I got very creative with Mike and actually recorded conversations because I never yeah. wanted to be in the position where I would be accused of coercing him or, you know, mm -hmm. doing all of that stuff. And it's interesting because the voice actually projects, I guess, the... A written document doesn't do it. Actually, gives you like you can hear the soft yeah. a different dimension. Yeah. Absolutely, but anyway, time's of the essence. So I'm going to ask one last question, and this is um, you know we've covered a lot of conversation and content with you know death, dying, and yod. If we were to create a vision and a model of end of life care to support people living with yod, what would it look like? And Alyssa, you've awarded a Churchill Fellowship, which allowed you to visit several overseas countries to, exa uh, to examine models of palliative care for dementia. What are, you know, maybe one or two salient points that you think might help to reimagine what that might look like for us? And then we'll go around the panel and just get a couple of good points, and then I'll hand Jade will take over after that. So thanks, everyone. Well, I think um, most importantly, the model needs to be co-designed with people with dementia and with carers, along with relevant health, aged care, community, primary care organisations. Um, care navigation is a really key um, point and ideally having a single point of contact for people with dementia and carers to help them navigate the system. Um, also advanced care planning throughout the course of the illness. Um, and not needing a spe intensive specialist palliative care throughout the entire disease trajectory, just at um, certain points, such as, for example, diagnosis, um, losing the ability to drive when you develop swallowing issues or continence issues, um, making that decision to go into residential care. Those are points at which more palliative care might be required. Anyone else want to comment? Okay, well, I'll tell you one thing. I'd, I'd like to clone all of you and have you in my corner, that's for sure. We need to absolutely emulate the best that there is and replicate it and have it available where we can. So, Jade, handing over to you now um, for the question and answer. Thanks, Vicky. My name's Jade. I have the pleasure of coordinating some of the question time at the end. So thank you to all of the panellists and to Vicky for facilitating such a wonderful conversation. And just thank you for all of the work you're doing in supporting and advancing palliative care and end-of-life care for people with young onset dementia. It was a great conversation. So there are a few questions starting to come through. Um, Ray, there's a lovely 
note of thanks to you for sharing your reflections. It's from somebody who was part of a care team for a friend who was Maori and kept at home with family and friends providing round the clock palliative care and really just reinforcing the importance of making the last weeks and days meaningful. So it was really a note of thanks for, for making that comment. Um, there is a, a, again, a bit of a comment from Linda saying that the Commonwealth is proposing that providers may decide whether a participant has legal capacity and that the Secretary of the Department of Health and Aged Care can appoint a representative overriding existing enduring guardianships and EPOAs developed under state territory jurisdiction. So I know we did touch on this, but it was really seeking further comments and, and possible action in that space. Craig, I don't know if, yeah, if you would like to respond. Sure, thank you. Um, and thanks for the question, Linda. I, I'm not aware of this myself, but I, I would imagine that this is something that is out for consultation perhaps or, or is being, the idea is being tested. It would be um, quite, I, I think, um, game changing in some ways. And so it would need to be think th thought through quite clearly. Um, but one thing that has come out through the Royal Commission as as an, an issue, particularly in the aged care sector, where um, things can go awry or, or people's situation can fall through the cracks, is the fact that the health and medical legislative framework is controlled by states and territories, and yet the Aged Care Act is Commonwealth funding. And so there are discrepancies in, for example, the definitions of what the Commonwealth calls representatives um, who might be people who are informally in some role of providing input about a person's care, as opposed to the, the formal legally um, grounded decision makers such as enduring powers of attorney or enduring guardians that are set up under state and territory law. So where there's, I guess my comment would be, if there's a way that that can be made more consistent, more understandable for the community um, and, and more streamlined, I think that it could be positive. Um, but but also it needs to be considered, I guess, as to the scope of the decisions that these people could be making. And um, yeah, thanks, Craig. Um, there is also a question around what you see um, in terms of changes to voluntary assisted dying to include dementia. Vicky, I do know this is something you've spoken about. Would you like to respond? Oh, look, I think um, I don't think we can really dwell on this for too long um, and I will hand over to Craig, but, you know, there was a 7.30 report recently on telly that um, it's clear that now VAD has been legislated in what five state territories that we've got quite a bit of um, experience with it now. And I know there are two states currently wanting to review their legislation to see if it can be extended to include people with dementia, but, you know. Um, I can speak to this, Vicky. Thanks. Um, so WA and Victoria are both currently reviewing their legislation. Both of the health ministers in those states have clearly stated that eligibility is not part of the scope of those reviews. So there is no um, plans in Australia at present to expand eligibility criteria for VAD to include people with dementia. Um, there's certainly some legal cases in Canada um, where this is being proposed and I suspect we'll watch there. But in Australia at the moment, there is no um, proposal from government to include people with dementia. And it would no longer be voluntary assisted dying in that case. It would be <laughs> because it, it wouldn't be voluntary. Um, but I think in the meantime, what we really need to do is massively improve access to palliative care for people with dementia so that we don't have people thinking the only choice is an excruciating death or VAD. Because at the moment, um, that's what the Dementia Australia position statement even says, they quote a carer saying that without the choice of VAD, the only choice is an excruciating death. And um, we need to make sure that that's not the case. Actually, I might ask a quick question, if I may. Um, I'm always curious about, you know, voluntary stopping eating and drinking. And if you look at the natural dying process, that towards the end of life, the body is shutting down and our appetite decreases. Weight loss is very common. Choking, Ray talked about. He actually described what that looks like quite well. 
Um, and I know Wendy, in your case with Keith, it was clear he, you know, that was um, not, you know, he didn't want to continue to be fed and stuff like that. You know, I see that personally. Wendy Mitchell, who has dementia and wrote three, has written three books. In her last book, she talks very clearly about her preference for being able to um, stop eating and drinking. And I know Colin Cartwright has that expression called putting down the spoon, which before we had medicalised death and dying, people would literally put down the spoon because their body didn't need any more nourishment. It was wanting to shut down. So that would signal to the family to come and have that living wake, that they should organise a funeral, and that process would be managed, and it would take usually about 10 to 14 days um, if it was managed well and all the symptoms and what have you. So, Alyssa, do you want to comment on that? Because I really feel we don't talk about this as a valid choice at the end of life, particularly for people with dementia. Or, or a normal part of the dying process and the way that I often explain it to families is that the brain is no longer um, telling the body how to eat or how to swallow, um, that people generally aren't hungry. Well, not if they're hungry um, and that they should be eating for pleasure um, rather than, you know, maintaining their weight. And it can be challenging in a very risk averse setting where we're very risk averse about people um, aspirating and therefore putting them on thick and fluids and soft diets, which they might not enjoy. Um, and also monitoring their weight and, you know, putting them on supplements to reverse weight loss in what is actually a natural dying process where they will be expected to eat um, to to lose weight. And, and that's where the role of palliative care can be very important to explicitly document that our goal now is not to maintain weight and it's not to get a certain number of calories in every day, but it's actually on pleasure um, from the taste of food, even if that's putting it in the mouth and, and spitting it out, um, rather than a focus on, on eating and drinking. Um, and also culturally, you know, the way that we show love and connection often is through food. Um, so it's also explaining to families that, you know, they can do this in, in different ways. Um, but I think that uh, palliative care understands really well that balance of risk um, versus um, the potential of, you know, side effects from eating and drinking. That's great. Yeah, thank you. There's another question that follows on quite nicely from that, acknowledging that medical teams in hospital often have difficulty identifying end-stage dementia and terminal delirium, and as a result, communication with families may not adequately prepare families for that end-of-life stage. So are there any resources that you can point teams to to help with the education of staff in this setting and in residential aged care to recognise those signs that end-of-life is near? Elisa, I might again ask if you'd like oh, to start <laughs> with that. I, I was actually thinking the end of life directions for aged care or LDAC mm -hmm. um, through Flinders University, which is a, a federally funded program. People might be aware of um, Care Search or LDAC. Um, so they have a dementia toolkit um, for aged care. Um, but I would defer to Ray, who works <laughs> in this space, of what he uses on the ground. Thanks, Elisa. Thank you. Um, yeah, for, for residential care line, for our service, we do get referrals directly from hospitals in terms of following up for end of life palliative care, even just to follow through on the initial discussions done by um, the hospital staff. So what we then do is go to the facility and provide um, on-site clinical deterioration, both for RNs and ENs, and even we've recently just developed a package for carers as well, because they're really the eyes and ears um, of aged care facilities. So if and when they are identifying clinical deterioration, then it's really empowering them to have a discussion with the RN. Um, and that said, you know, in, involving the family members then um, because then it is a holistic type meeting um, and then reinforcing what was mentioned at the hospital really and then offering um, the support that they may require then whether that's in-house through their GPs or through an external palliative specialist that can go in and have that sort of complex discussion. Fantastic and we will put some resources and links together with the recording so we might be able to add some of those examples to that list. That's great, thank you. Um, there's another question from Naomi noting or asking whether the single point of contact similar to the Yod 
key worker role that was previously funded before the NDIS and lobbying for a service like that would help on the basis of supporting people from point of diagnosis through to end of life care. So are there any panel members who'd like to comment on I that? Do, I can talk about that um, if you want. Yeah, that would be great. Because okay. because that's what we, my husband was pre-NDIS. So when he was diagnosed, um, the memory clinic that he went to to get his diagnosis actually gave us a pamphlet and the pamphlet was for um, at that point and uh, Alzheimer's WA and so we made an appointment and the Yod key worker she was called at the time um, was our point of um, uh, reference and so we made an appointment we went to see her and she gave us all the information that we needed about all the different um uh groups that he could attend um everything everything we needed um and we just went from there so i found it very very useful i feel that we got a lot of very good information now i don't know who would hold that position now which which organization but um at that point there was only alzheimer's wa so it was pretty straightforward um, i would the, imagine wendy that in the ndis with mm -hmm. the funding they have care coordinators oh, as okay. part of the package but well, i agree with you though for me the yod key worker was mm -hmm. absolutely outstanding mm -hmm. and i mean we've got admirable admirable they are admir admirable but Admiral nurses in the UK. We've got McCusker nurses. I yeah. feel that there is a, um, you it's know, just, we, we've got knowing. direct trained nurses knowing. who could be doing that and with us on the journey and it yeah. could sit on a primary health network platform. Right. I mean, even, I'd love to see a hub. Even the, uh, I mean, there was even a psychologist in that bit, you oh. know, if you happen to need a little bit of emotional support, you know, it was, it was very well rounded. Mm. Oh. Great. And we are running very short on time. So I think that almost does bring us to the end of our conversation. But I think it really, I guess in, in closing, it really shows the importance of continuing this conversation. I think of, of continuing the advocacy and awareness raising work. And I think working collectively to, to try and see that vision of an ideal model of, of care really coming into fruition. So I think it's a fantastic conversation today. So thank you again, Vicky, for facilitating and for bringing such a, a fantastic, wonderful panel together. And I think through um, the odd SIG network, we'd really like to find ways to, to continue the conversation and continue this work. Vicky, did you want to make any final comments in closing? Um, well, really, I just want to thank the panel members. I mean, been great um, collegiality over the years. And, you know, it's good to know I'm among good company and the best that there is in the space and to keep up the good work and also... I can't, I'm indebted to our YOD network because actually without that peer support and what I, the, the knowledge and the learning and, um, you know, I only know what I know really because of them and my own lived experience with Michael. So, you know, I'm indebted to everyone. So thank you very much. Yeah, fantastic. We will make a, a copy of the recording available so that will get sent out to all attendees. So we would like to thank everybody who's attending today and who registered for the event. And we'll also link some additional resources just to help with, with next steps. So thank you everyone so much for attending. Thanks again to all of our panellists. Thank you.